So here at Bloomberg, we're concerned with the economy. And the global economy has been based to a significant degree on the multinational institutions created in the wake of World War II. They seem to be moving, maybe even dissolving. What comes next as we see the future? And particularly as the UN meets here now, I'm struck by the fact that the president of China, the president of Russia, the president of France, and the prime minister of the UK aren't even showing up to the UN. Yeah, well, you, you, you've got a, a very divided world today. And a lot of the institutions have grown up on the basis that everyone can come together, essentially around an American-centric view of the world. And you have uh, Russia, you have China, uh, you have countries that are, are, don't want to be aligned either with America or with China, but want to keep in with both. So you've got a completely different world that's, that's evolving. And the institutions were all, cre were all created for a different time. So even the U UN Security Council, when you think about it, I mean, it's completely irrational that you don't have Germany or Japan or India, Brazil, Indonesia, you know, large countries that aren't represented in the permanent structures of the UN. The difficulty is, how do you, how do you change those institutions when you require everyone's consent to do it? So I, I think you're going for the, for the foreseeable future. There will be issues ar around which people come together, you know, global pandemics, potentially climate change, um, maybe stabilizing the global economy. There's, there's areas, of course, where America and China are going to have to work together. But the, the world is multipolar and polarized around, essentially, I think, Two, two, two blocks that are emerging, one of countries that are close allies of America, the other which are um, allies of China. Does that almost necessarily mean we'll have a more reduced growth going forward globally? Because we had two blocks of the Soviet Union and the United States, but the Soviet Union wasn't that big an economic player. China is. Yeah, that, that's the, the huge difference. I mean, when the Soviet Union broke up, I think its exports to the U.S. was something like $200 million. <laughs> I mean, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of trade still existing between um, America and China. China obviously holds, I think, almost $800 billion worth of, of dollar reserves. So, you know, it's a, it's a, this is, at one level, it's much more integrated, but in these past few years, you know, globalization has come under, under attack for, for reasons that are good. Um, in one sense, when you look at issues to do with security and people's anxieties about supply chains and so on. But then I think also issues that are more to do with protectionism. And we should never forget that the era of globalization brought enormous benefit to the world, uh, including high levels of growth, low levels of inflation, and of course, great numbers of people lifted out of poverty. One of the areas where there is continued uh, tension is something you know terribly well, which is the Middle East. You spent a lot of time over there, I know, particularly on the Palestinian issue. Now we hear that there may be the makings of a deal with Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Israel. What do you know about that? What are the prospects for it? I, I think you, you still advise the Saudi government, do, do you not? Yeah, we, we have a close relationship with many of the countries in the region. We have a team of people work on the modernization program there in Saudi. I have an office in Israel. Uh, and, and, and also in, in the United Arab Emirates. Um, well, <laughs> the whole of the Middle East is undergoing a huge change. And I think the, the essence of the struggle in the Middle East really revolves around the desire of people there across the cultural spectrum, right? Whether you're in the Jewish state of Israel or in predominantly Muslim countries, the desire of people to move towards what I call rule-based economies and religiously tolerant societies. And when you look at the modernization program, for example, that's going on in Saudi or in the United Arab Emirates or elsewhere in, in the Gulf and Qatar, Bahrain and so on, you can, you can see that it's illogical for those countries to be hostile to Israel. I mean, they share many of the same anxieties about the region, and particularly the role of, of, of Iran. They can see in the state of Israel, um, for all its challenges and difficulties right now, a country that's become you know, extraordinary in terms of the development of its economy, its technology, and so on, that plays an outsized role in the world. And therefore, if you're 
looking at this from, a, from the perspective of the Gulf states, you still care about the Palestinian issue and you would like it resolved and it remains a critical issue in the politics of the Middle East. But underneath, you're thinking, look at all the things we've got in common. <laughs> you know, so to, to end up in a situation where you're, you're divided from, from Israel, just, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to these countries today. There have been recurring humanitarian issues, obviously, in the Middle East. But moving on from the humanitarian to the economic, could the Middle East really represent an opportunity? Certainly Israel has been the startup nation, as they call it. Uh, Saudi Arabia and, and UAE have enormous, Qatar, have enormous amounts of resources. And Saudi Arabia particularly is trying to diversify their economy. Is there a, a world in which that is really a growth engine for the world? Yeah, potentially, absolutely. And, and that, that modernization process is all about these countries that are big oil and gas producers saying, look, we also see the way the world's changing because of issues to do with climate change and so on. And they want to divide, diversify their economy. They want to educate their people. The number of women in the Saudi workforce has virtually doubled in the last six years. So, but it's all about moving towards an open-minded approach to the world, towards a situation where you put religion in its proper place and don't turn it into a, a political ideology. And, and therefore, where if you're in the region, you're thinking, how do we make sense of this region? Well, the answer is to, to, to come together and to be able to do things together in the common interest. Let's turn to uh, British politics, if we could, a bit. You've had something to do that in the past. Uh, according to the polls, if they're to be believed, the Labour Party, your Labour Party, seems like it's in reasonable sh good shape for the next election. We never know till the election happens, but in reasonably good shape. Uh, you were famous for new Labour, as we came to understand it in Britain. Is there room for a new new Labour? Is there a different version of what the Labour Party did back in your day? Yes, I, I, th I think there is, and it's all around the technology revolution. I mean, in my view, the, the single toughest thing for politicians today is to get their heads around what is the big real world event. I mean, leave all those things aside, all the things we're talking about in geopolitics, America, China, and so on. The big real world event is this technology revolution. And particularly with generative AI, it's going to change everything. It's going to change the way we live, the way we work. It should change government, by the way, the way government operates, the way public services operate. It's got enormous potential to change the healthcare system for the better. But then there are huge risks because it's a general purpose technology. You can use it for bad as well as for good. So this is the biggest challenge. And I say to people in the, on the progressive side of politics, the progressive mission for the 21st century is how you understand this revolution, master it and harness it. And, and that's the, because interesting, when you look at the 19th century industrial revolution, it took politics a long time to catch up with the real world event that was happening. And if we're not careful, it'll be the same today because the policy makers and the change makers often inhabit different spaces. We need to bring them together. We need to see what the opportunities are, see what the risks are. But this is, for me, if I was back in government today, I would be reshaping the whole of the government agenda around it. Great Britain had a little something to do, as I recall, with the Industrial <coughs> Revolution. But you were bestride an empire at that point. And that empire no longer exists. Is Great Britain large enough to really help drive the generative AI revolution? Well, it can be part of it. And it, it's, it's already one of the leading countries on AI. We've got a strong university sector. Uh, we've got a great life science sector. Um, we have one of the greatest AI companies uh, in the world, DeepMind, uh, in the UK. Um, the UK technology sector is, 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 is thriving. We need to keep this and, and we need to develop it. But no, Britain, if, if I had to characterize the economic niche for Britain going forward, one major part of it would be around being a, an, an AI hub for innovation and development. What about the future for Brexit and what happens with the UK? Uh, Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, has said that he'd like to kind of revisit that a little bit. You've been very outspoken about your views on Brexit in the past. How far can the UK go? How far should it go to try to reintegrate with Europe? So it's, it's, it's hard to judge because the, look, we got out of, of, of Europe. It was our major trading relationship. We ruptured our trading relations with Europe. But we also now are out of the political union of our own continent. And in a world where it's going to be dominated by America, by China, possibly in time India, those will be the three giants of world politics. You're going to find around the world people coming together in regional blocks. 
in order to be able to sit at the same table as the giants. Right? This is, you can see this happening all over the world. So for Britain to be absent from Europe is a real problem for us. However, having left it, getting back in is a tricky, tricky negotiation. There's an economic aspect. I think there are certain things that can move us closer with Europe without going back into the European bloc. But then I think there's a question of the political dimension to this. <clears throat> and there is a suggestion that we build a broader European political community. President Macron's talked about this. And Britain, I think, can, can, can play a part there. And in areas like defense or energy or science and innovation, you know, we can, we can build those blocks of cooperation with Europe that move us closer. Whether we get to a stage where Britain rejoins the European Union, I think that's for a, a future time. But you, know, you should never forget that two thirds of the population over 65 voted for Brexit and two thirds under 35 mm -hmm. voted to stay. <laughs> One last question. Uh, all Americans wonder it all the time, and that's the monarchy. You know a little bit about the monarchy. Take us forward. What is the role, if there is a role, for the British, for the British civilization, as it were, for the monarchy going forward? Fifty years from now, will it be there? I think so. I mean, but it's, it's a unifying force. And, and the great thing that the Queen did was that she managed to steer the monarchy through this period of enormous social and economic and political change and still keep it as this cohesive you know, um, uh, institution that allowed whatever other differences people have, they came together around it. And King Charles, to be fair, I think, has got the same sense of, of public service, the same you know, commitment to the institution of the monarchy. And I think for my generation and younger, you know, it's a less deferential world that we live in, but our preference is to have a the monarchy rather than a, an elected president. So I, I, I think it'll stay. I, I hope it does.